you brought a Bible with you today, let's turn over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I've entitled this today, Different Labels, But the Same Poison. As we are continuing our series, Secure Forever, God's Promise or Our Perseverance. Which one is it? It can't be both. Is, is our security in Christ, is our eternal life, is our assurance of salvation, which, by the way, God wants us to know that we have eternal life. The Bible's very clear on that. Uh, does God, uh, is that based on what, what God has done for us? Is it God's promise, or is it a matter of us persevering and being faithful? And by the way, that's what persevering means. You're being faithful. You are enduring. You are uh, living the Christian life. Uh, is it based on that, or is it all based on what Christ has done for us? You know, I used to work in the grocery business, and uh, many years ago, I worked my way through Bible college in the grocery business. And, um, you know, here in America, we, you go to a grocery store, and there's so many different choices on an aisle. I mean, uh, it's, it's just amazing how many choices there are. If you go places overseas, many places that you go, you don't see super markets, so to speak, or super targets, or super Coburns, or super Walmarts, or whatever you want to call them, all right? There are these little places about the, maybe a little bigger, about the size of a 7-Eleven, that's the grocery store. You go in, and if you want cereal, maybe there's two kinds total there. Um, this is the way it is in many places. Well, not in America. You go into America and you go in virtually any aisle in our grocery stores, our regular grocery stores even, and you see a variety of products. Well, I can remember years ago when I was working in the grocery business, I was a stockman, and uh, that means you stock shelves. People buy, you replace things, and, and you put it in there. And one of the things that I always thought was interesting you know, there are certain products you just, uh, even though you may use a product and it may not be the famous version of that, that's a lot of the times what we call it, right? Like uh, you go into a place, you say, give me a Coke. Well, they may not have actual Coca-Cola, but they understand what you're talking about and so on. One of those products was on the cleaning or on the uh, detergent aisle, and that product was Clorox. Now, how many of you know what Clorox is? Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad. Okay, it's bleach. Bleach. Clorox is bleach. All right. Uh, there were other products that were virtually identical to Clorox, but they had different labels. Uh, there would be the, the, uh, the store brand. That would be a generic one. There would be another one. There would be another one. Sometimes there's three or four different brands of bleach. You look at the ingredients there, they're virtually all alike. And by the way, if you drink any of them, they'll virtually do the same thing. <laughs> you will die. You will die. Why? Because they're poison. And yet you look at them, and you know what? Yeah, but they all have different labels. Yeah, but it's the same poison inside. It's the same poison inside. Well, in way of introducing this message, I would like to state again why we are covering this issue that we've been in now for actually 12 weeks. We've got a couple more left, by the way. Why are we covering this in detail? Why are we making such a deal about is salvation eternal or not? Um, what is your assurance of salvation based on? Is it based on what Christ did? Is it based on a combination of what Christ did and what you do? Is it based on what you do? Why does it matter? Um, and all these kind of things. Now, a lot of people don't think it does matter. But folks, the truth of it is it matters greatly. It matters greatly. There's one message of salvation. The Bible calls it the gospel. And there's a reason that word is used, because the word gospel means good news. Now, salvation, God's salvation, what he provides for us is good news. Okay? But what man does is he takes it and he hijacks the word and he, he creates false gospels, false messages that in fact, even though maybe, maybe, the people preaching them may be well-meaning, many times they're blind and they don't understand what they're saying. They don't understand the 
the wrongness of what they're saying. Now, that doesn't mean all of them. There's a lot of them that do understand what they're saying. And they are committed to a, according to the Bible, a false gospel, a false message of good news, which, by the way, if it's not the good news of the Bible, it's not good news, it's bad news. So we need to understand that. Now, I would like to state again why we're covering this issue in detail. It is simply this, and I want you to get this on the front end today, because where we're going with this today, I've got more quotes to share with you this week. And, you know, if you don't understand what's behind what we're saying, you just might misunderstand what we're getting at. This is the driver. Why are we covering it in detail? It is simply this. It is because we don't want people to be confused or end up in hell. Okay? Nothing would be worse than being deceived into trusting in a false source for your salvation and having your faith in this false source. And when you die, you wake up immediately in hellfire, and you'll be there forever, okay? Friend, listen, we want you to understand there's only one way into heaven, and it is by trusting in Jesus Christ as the one who died for your sins and rose from the grave. There is no other way, okay? Uh, You might say, what about all the other religions? If they don't agree with what I just shared with you, they're wrong, You might say, well, that's a bold statement. It's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, that's pretty narrow. There's four absolutes. You might say, well, I don't believe in absolutes. Are you sure there's no absolutes? Absolutely. I'm sure there's no absolutes. Well, you're a walking contradiction, friend. No, the truth of it is there are absolutes. See, the reason we need a Savior is because we cannot save ourselves. That's why we need a Savior. We must be perfectly sinless to get into heaven, and none of us are. Because of that, because we're sinners, we stand hopeless, we stand helpless, we stand lost. Hopeless, helpless, and lost. This is why we need a Savior. And this is why the Bible says what it does. Look with me to Galatians 2, verse 21. It says this. Paul says, I do not frustrate, disannul is what the word means, to make of no effect. I do not frustrate the grace of God, God's unmerited favor, God's undeserved mercy. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, which is good works, then Christ is dead in vain. Jesus wasted his life. If you could work your way to heaven, if you could qualify yourself by faithfulness, by perseverance, if you could get to heaven by being a faithful person, even if you call yourself a faithful Christian, If your basis of getting into heaven to any extent has to do with your performance, then Jesus wasted his time. Nowhere in the Bible will you find a message that to get to heaven, it's Jesus and his work plus your work. No, it's all in Christ. That's why he came. He came because there's not a thing we could do to save ourselves. That's why it says, and even in Isaiah 43, it says, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. See, we cannot save ourselves. That's why we need a Savior because we can't save ourselves. Look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is why Jesus came, and this is why Jesus did what he did. Let me illustrate this for you today. This made it clear to me when I was 19. Now, up to that point in my life, I believed that I had to uh, be a good person to get to heaven. That's what was going to get me there. Now, let me pause right here and say, listen, we are a Bible-believing, teaching, and preaching church here, and we believe Christians ought to live faithful Christian lives. But that does not get you to heaven. 
that does not get you to heaven. As a matter of fact, if you want to understand a lot about the Christian life, come tonight as we are studying 1 John. You'll learn a lot about the Christian life in 1 John. But look up here. Let me explain it to you. Where I've been so far, and then you'll, you'll get an understanding of this. If this hand were to represent you and me, if we let this wallet represent our sin, here we are. The Bible says we're all sinners. That includes me and you. All of us have sinned. All of us. God loves us. He hates our sin, but he loves us. See, to get to heaven, you have to be sinless. Here you go. Listen carefully. Not even one lie, not even one thing that sins can get into heaven, according to Revelation 21, 27. Have you ever told a lie? Yes. Have you ever sinned? Yes. Guess what? You're disqualified, and so am I. We're all sinners. To get to heaven, we have to be sinless. None of us are. Not only that, God says this. We have sinned against him. We have violated his law. We have violated his word, and there is a debt that has to be paid. Okay, you break the law, you have to pay the price. And God says the wages of sin is death. That means we would have to die physically and spend forever separated from God if we are to pay for our own sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the wages of sin is good works. Nowhere. The Bible tells us, therefore, we are sinners, we are guilty, we stand condemned, and the scriptures make it very clear there's nothing we could do to get rid of this, this sin on our own. We'd have to die and be forever separated from God. God doesn't want that for us. So what did he do? Because he loves us so much, hates our sin, but loves us. He came into the world, this hand representing Jesus Christ. He's God in the flesh. He is sinless. When Jesus went to the cross, dear friend, watch this. When Jesus went to the cross, he took our sin, your sin, my sin upon himself. He took it and he made the complete payment for every sin you've done or ever will do wrong in your entire life. Remember, when Jesus died for you, all your sins were in the future, right? You hadn't been born yet unless you're extremely old. But when Jesus died on the cross, he took our sins upon himself. He made the payment and rose from the grave three days later. And he says this in his word, that if you will put your faith, your trust in him, he will give you as a gift everlasting life, as a gift. He'll never lose you. He'll never cast you out. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way, for he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You notice it's in him. Because we cannot save ourselves by our works, our effort, or faithfulness, that is why Jesus came. And a price had to be paid for our sins, but the good news is Jesus did it. He paid the price. Make no mistake about it. Sin has to be paid for. My sin has to be paid for. Your sin has to be paid for. But when Jesus died on the cross, he made the payment for it, so you don't have to. And he came back from the dead. See, that's why he said when he was on the cross, he said, it's finished. It means paid in full. And he came back from the dead, and he says, if you will put your faith in him, believe in him that he did that for you, he will save you by his grace for all eternity. It's a gift. You can know before you ever get up today from your seat, you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die. How do you know that? Because God promises that to the one who believes in Christ. 1 John 5, 13. But you see, good works won't do it. That's why it says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, 28, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Without. Now, there's no higher deeds than the commandments. But you notice what it says? If you put your faith, if you put your trust in Christ, you are justified by faith without, apart from the deeds of the law. So it isn't a mixture of the grace of God and good works. No, it's all what Christ has done. It's all what Christ has done. Now, listen carefully now. I've explained that to you. While many people will on the surface agree that we cannot work our way to heaven, they will turn right around and say that you must do good works in addition to faith 
in order to be saved in the end, okay, or, and here's, here's where a lot of them are, are going off today, or you need to do good works in order to prove that you're saved. Well, let me ask you this. How many good works do you have to do to prove you're saved? No one ever gives you the answer to that. See, here's the truth of it. You could do good works from this moment on for the rest of your life and do nothing but good works. And if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ alone as your Savior, friend, and I don't mean this in an irreverent way, you will go to hell when you die. The only way you can go to heaven is through Jesus. It's only Him. So this idea, well, you have to prove you're saved. Now, i got a question for you. Has anybody ever asked this question? Who do you have to prove you are saved to? Who? Do you have to prove it to God? Doesn't he already know? Do you have to prove it to yourself? Well, don't you know in your head whether you've trusted Christ as your Savior or not? Do you have to prove it to other people? What do they matter? They don't keep the gates. By the way, neither does Peter. Neither does Peter. See, uh, their false uh, way of salvation, there's four names for it. And all of them, they're all different labels, and it's all the same poison. All right? The first one is what we call discipleship salvation. Discipleship salvation. Now, all of these things sound good, but none of them will say because it's including your good works into the picture. Discipleship salvation. Now, what is, the, what is that? Well, what is a disciple? Literally, a, a disciple is one who learns from another, a learner. That's literally what it is. Now, the expectation in the word disciple is that you are learning with the mindset that you are going to follow the teaching you learn. That's the idea. So here's what that means. It means that, that okay, you're, you're committing to this, and you're going to be faithful to what you learn, and that's how, that's how you're going to get in. Is through that. Another one means the same thing, but it's a different title. It's called lordship salvation. In other words, you must live in submission to Jesus as the master and lord of your life. This is through surrender and obedience. But again, friend, I got a question for you. To what level of commitment do you have to live? And how long do you have to do it? Well, from the beginning, for the rest of your life, okay, then wouldn't it be easier just to get saved about five minutes before you die? No, that's not the way of God. Jesus paid it all, okay? Well, don't you think a Christian ought to live for Christ? Amen. Yes, I do. I think a Christian means you're already a Christian, ought to live for Christ. But whether you succeed or fail... If you're saved, you're saved. Okay? Here's another term, and they usually don't use this, but I think it's a good description. Bilateral salvation. Bilateral salvation. In other words, when when you become a Christian, you enter into a contract with God. God, if you'll do your part, I'll do mine. God, if you promise to save me, I will be faithful and live my life for you. Do you think you're going to get into heaven that way? See, it's well-meaning. The problem is, folks, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. And the last one, which we've been talking quite about, uh, a lot about in the series, is the perseverance of the saints. Now, folks, four labels, they're all the same, and they're all poison. Perseverance of the saints says this, you must persevere in faithfulness and good works if you are going to make it to heaven. What do you do with 1 John 5, 13, where it says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. These are four different labels, but the same poison. They are works for salvation. Listen, folks. To confuse discipleship with salvation is to add works to faith 
as the basis for salvation. This is a false gospel that cannot save because you are adding to the work of Christ your works. Well, you messed it up. It's like someone going to an art masterpiece in a museum, okay? Here's this masterpiece admired by, by thousands, maybe millions, forever. And you go up to it and you look at it and at it and you're there and you're looking at it and everybody's going, oh, wow, this is amazing and all that. And, and, and you pull out your Sharpie and you say, well, you know, let me fix this over here. You know what? The guards would come. They would arrest you. Maybe people would beat you up. Why? They're defending the work of the master. Guess what? We have a responsibility to defend the work of the master. The work of the master is what Jesus did on the cross. He did the work. All he asks us to do is trust in him that he did that for us. The late Dr. M. R. D. Hahn, he said this. This is just a partial quote. He says, there is a vast difference between coming to Jesus for salvation and coming after Jesus for service. Coming to Christ makes one a believer, while coming after Christ makes one a disciple. All believers are not disciples. To become a believer, one accepts the invitation of the gospel. To be a disciple, one obeys the challenge to a life of dedicated service and separation. Salvation comes through the sacrifice of Christ. Discipleship comes only by sacrifice of self and surrender to his call for devoted service. Listen carefully. Salvation, I'm still quoting, salvation is free, but discipleship involves paying the price of a separated walk. Salvation cannot be lost because it depends upon God's faithfulness, but discipleship, it's how you live, can be lost because it depends upon our faithfulness. Do you see the difference there? They're not the same. Salvation and discipleship are not the same. So to say, well, the way you get to heaven is through a discipleship salvation, a lordship salvation, a bilateral salvation, the perseverance of the saints is adding man's good works into the equation. You might say, no one believes that, do they? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And I'm, I've got some quotes for you in just a couple minutes. But let me show you over in Ephesians chapter 2 before we launch into this next section here. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now, you know this idea of political correctness. Let me, let, me, let me say this, okay? I don't agree with, with uh, the way our president does a lot of what he does. I don't agree with it. I wish he quit tweeting. I wish he'd be a little bit more diplomatic, maybe a lot more diplomatic about some things, okay? But I'll tell you what, we're seeing some awful good things, aren't we? If we didn't see anything else except a president who was pro-Israel, I'd be happy, but we're seeing even more of that. But listen, he came onto the scene, and, and you know what? A lot of what he says, I cringe at some of the stuff he says, and I, and I pray for him on a regular basis, and we need to do that. And by the way, this Tuesday, you need to vote. Yes. You need to vote. Listen, Christian friend, you have, an, you have an obligation as an American citizen to go to the polls and vote, Okay? But here's the point. Did you know that, uh, well, he, he came along the scene, it's like, okay, he took the idea of political correctness and basically threw it out the window and says, you know what, I'm just going to tell you what I think. Again, sometimes that's good and sometimes not. But I'll tell you what, he says, I'm going to tell you what I think. Now, you know what's really important? Is that we let God speak. And not only that, but friend... If somebody is saying something that's not true, it's okay to say, hey, you know what so-and-so is saying? That's not, that doesn't line up with Scripture. Now, that's a no-no. I'm telling you, that's a no-no. You're not supposed to do that. But it is part of what a pastor and a teacher and a preacher is supposed to do. We don't do it to uh, crucify people's character. 
We simply do it to point out what is wrong with their message. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says this, For by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. God's grace, God's unmerited favor. Are you saved through faith? You notice it doesn't say faith and commitment, faith and faithfulness. It doesn't say faith and baptism. It doesn't say faith and good works. It doesn't say faith and money. It says faith. Faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. You're not saved of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yet, let me quote you what's being said today. Those who believe in a lordship salvation, discipleship salvation, perseverance of the saints, bilateral salvation. Here's what they're saying. Quote, we mean that the saints will and must persevere in obedience, which comes from faith. There are many warnings in Scripture that those who do not hold fast to Christ can be lost in the end. He continues, Nevertheless, we must also own up to the fact that our final salvation is made contingent upon the subsequent obedience, which comes from faith, unquote. You might say, who said that? John Piper. John Piper. See, folks, when Jesus dealt with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he had every opportunity to spell out to Nicodemus, who was, by the way, an eager listener. Jesus didn't seek out Nicodemus. Nicodemus sought out Christ. And what did Jesus tell him? Look at it with me. John chapter 3. When it came, we know in the early verses in John chapter 3, Jesus says twice, you have to be born again if you're going to see the kingdom, if you're going to enter the kingdom. You have to be born again. And then he tells them how to be born again. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, speaking of himself, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What comes as a result of believing in Christ, putting your faith, your trust in him? You will not perish. You have everlasting life. Now, isn't that what Jesus said? Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he is not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is what God says. Now, I've heard people say, and I, I show them, what do you do with this? Isn't that true? What Jesus told them, isn't that truth? Here's what I've been told. Well, Jesus, it's true what Jesus said, but he didn't tell them everything. What? He didn't tell them everything. Friend, the man wanted to be saved, and what Jesus told him wasn't all of it. And you're telling me then that Jesus withhold information for the man's salvation. That's crazy. Okay? It's crazy. Let's take another look at a story, and you can turn there if you want, and I can just tell you where it's found. In Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 39, Philip, of course, he's told, go down into Gaza. There's somebody there I want you to talk to. Of course, there was a eunuch and a chariot, and he was reading Isaiah 53. Imagine that. How's that for a divine appointment? And so the guy, say, Philip says, you understand what you're reading? He says, no, I don't understand it. I need somebody to tell me what it means. Acts 8, 37. Because the guy wanted to be baptized. He says, I want to be baptized. And, and what hinders me, he says, from being baptized? Now, here's what Philip tells him. Let me misread it. And Philip said, well, if you believe and you promise that you're going to live a faithful life as a Christian and endure to the end, I'll baptize you. It's not what he said. He said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
He put his faith in him. Now, in the context, it was John, Isaiah 53, which is very clearly an Old Testament passage having to do with the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross as the full payment for our sins. The eunuch got it. And guess what? Philip knew he got it because he stopped the chariot and he says, okay, let's get baptized. Let, let me baptize you. And he did. But he wouldn't baptize him until he had put his faith in Jesus Christ as a Savior. No record anywhere in the passage, because it's not there, of anything else Philip told him to do. Only believe. Only believe. And yet people are saying, believing's not enough. You also have to do other things. Who's right? Well, I know who's right. See, the eunuch's answer was a simple one. It was direct and it was matter of fact, clear and plain. Here's another one, Philippians. I mean, not Philippians. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30 and 31. Philippian jailer. Okay, Paul and Silas are there. They're singing hymns. It's around midnight. They hadn't turned their clocks back either, by the way. Anyways, I just thought I'd throw that in. It was around midnight and uh, they're singing and there's an earthquake and everybody's scared. You know, the doors fly open and the jailer comes, falls, trembling, falls. And he says the most loaded question in all of scripture, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, Paul's a theologian. He's got this thing wired, folks. Listen, he was taught directly by Jesus. He knows what to tell him. And he said, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's what they told him. Believe on the, they didn't say believe and, believe promise, believe start, believe stop. They said, believe, and you'll be saved. Yet those who teach a lordship salvation or a perseverance of the saints would disagree with that simplicity that we find in the gospel. Okay? Another propagator, a very popular propagator of lordship salvation would be John MacArthur, and he says, quote, and I quote, any doctrine of eternal security that leaves out perseverance distorts the doctrine of salvation itself. Now, listen, these, these quotes are not taken out of context. I have the books in my library. Look closely at that statement. Is he not saying that there must be perseverance to be eternally secure? Yes, he is. Perseverance, folks, has to do with our faithfulness and works. It doesn't have to do with the cross work of Christ. This is why, by the way, in the same article, he calls lordship salvation, and I quote, he calls lordship salvation working faith salvation. Working faith salvation. There is no such thing. It's clearly mixing works with faith. But that's how he sees the doctrine of perseverance. He sees it as lordship salvation. As a matter of fact, he says this, and I quote, Lordship salvation is nothing other than the doctrine of perseverance, unquote. It's exactly what it is. Now, by the way, let me say this for any Baptist who may be watching over, over the, the thing here. Friend, listen, a, a, a lot of us will say, well, oh yeah, salvation's by grace alone, through faith alone, Christ the Lord alone. When you trust Christ, you're saved. You're saved forever. You have it. And then they'll say, but... If you don't do this and this and this and this and start doing this and stop doing that, then you don't have it. All right? You know what? You are preaching exactly the same error. Again, until you accept Jesus Christ, until you trust in him alone as your Savior, you're the one who doesn't have it. Salvation comes when you understand you can't even lift your little pinky to save yourself. And you put your faith only in Christ as your Savior. Now, once we're saved, ought we to live for Christ? Yes, we know that. But this is so important. You see, to say that you will or you must persevere is to say that you must be faithful and do good works. You're saying that faith alone in Christ is not enough. You're saying you have to do more. Did you notice how I said that? You have to what? do more. Jesus says, no, wait a minute. It's done. 
I did it on the cross. You simply trust in me. Look with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Now again, why are we covering this? Why are we mentioning these things? Why am I quoting these people? Because I don't want you to misunderstand, friends, the sufficiency of the cross work of Jesus Christ. There are people who will say, oh, you, oh, you're one of those. You guys believe in cheap grace. Man alive, them are fighting words. There is no such thing as cheap grace, only amazing grace. Okay? And if it wasn't by grace, none of us would be saved. That's why it says, for by grace are you saved. Through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we uh, say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found for if Abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before God jump down to verse 5 but to him that worketh not but believeth instead but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness stop right there Verse 5, excuse me, verse 5. What does it say is counted for righteousness, students? Faith. Faith is counted for righteousness. Not faith in works. Faith is counted for righteousness. Listen, if I put my faith in Jesus Christ, God sees that and he sees my faith and he gives me his righteousness that moment. Friend, if I have his righteousness, can I go to heaven? Yes. Yes. So if I have heaven as a present possession and somebody comes along and says, no, 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 that's not enough. You have to do these things to have eternal life. Okay, if this was eternal life, when I trusted Christ, God gave that to me. Somebody comes along and says, w- w- wait a minute, wait, you're saying it's faith alone and Christ alone that, that gives you eternal life? No, no, it's more than that. You have to do more than that. I can say, no, wait a minute. You're, you're confused, friend. I already have it. Don't tell me I have to do things to get it yet because I already got it. Well, why do you believe that? Jesus said it. I think I can believe him, right? The quotes continue. He says this, quote, now listen carefully. Again, MacArthur. God's own holiness thus requires perseverance requires perseverance he continues god's grace ensures our persevering but this does not make it any less our persevering so he's saying you have to persevere if you're going to get there but god will provide for you the grace so that you can So what God does basically gives you the gasoline so that you can run. He gives you the fuel so that you can do the work. That's not salvation. Salvation's a gift. It's a gift. Is that not what the Bible says? Yes. In the book, Hard to Believe, in speaking about how to be saved, he was talking about the rich young ruler he says this, quote, the young man wouldn't do either, admit his sin or deny himself. Now, see, what he's doing is confusing discipleship with salvation. That's why I gave you those quotes at the beginning by Dehan. They were so clear. But he says here, uh, MacArthur, he says, the young man wouldn't do either, admit his sin or deny himself, as verse 22 tells us, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions He decided he'd rather hold on to the deception of self-righteousness and have his money and possessions than have Jesus. He had no interest in self-denial, self-sacrifice, or submission. Now remember the context of this. He's saying this is necessary for salvation. Therefore, he was unworthy to be Jesus' disciple. Okay, here we go. And he himself shut the door to the kingdom of, of salvation. Because he was not willing to promise to work, he shut the door to the kingdom of salvation. He continues. Here's what he says. If we're not willing to separate 
from our family, separate from the world, separate from the material things that we possess, then Jesus isn't that valuable to us. It's an all or nothing proposition. Unquote. Okay? You might say, well, then what, what is that talking about? Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 gives us the answer. Because you can read that and you say, well, it does seem like Jesus is saying you have to do that to go to heaven. See, folks, Jesus had an advantage that we don't have. Do you know what it was? He can read minds. He can discern the heart. He knew what was going on inside the young man. And he challenged him, just like the law does. People think, well, you know, I keep the commandments. I'm going to heaven because I keep the commandments. So do you? Have you ever lied before? Well, yeah. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, yeah. Have you ever... Uh, have you ever lusted after something that wasn't yours? Well, yeah. Have you ever put anything before God in your life ever? Well, yeah. You keep the commandments? You're guilty. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's getting to the heart of it. You might say, how do you know that? Mark chapter 10, verse 24. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered and get and saith unto them, children, watch it, here it is. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Why could the young man not get into the kingdom? Because he was trusting in his riches instead of Christ. That's what Jesus was getting at. He was exposing what was in the heart of this young man. Here's more quotes from the same book. <clears throat> Quote, the thought is that if you want to be Christ's disciple and receive forgiveness and eternal life, do you see how he's mixing the two? You must refuse to associate any longer with the person you are. Now that's not easy to do. You are sick of your sinful self and want nothing to do with you anymore. And it may mean not just you, but your family. Unquote. Now, folks, listen. This is outrageous. Are you listening? Are you seeing it? What he's saying? You have to give up all these things. You have to be willing to give up your family if you want to be saved. You have to give up everything you have if you want to be saved. Now, that's not easy to do. That's not the message of the gospel. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Do I really have to quit associating with my family if I want to receive forgiveness of my sin and receive eternal life? Really? If I want to go to heaven, I have to quit associating with my family? That's an incredible... It, it continues, quote... The complete surrender of all possessions in the, is the essence of salvation. It uh, is the essence of salvation. It is, I give up everything. I deny myself. I offer my life both in terms of death and, if need be, and in terms of obedience of life. Unquote. Death, if need be? Now, wait a minute. Now, what are you saying? Is that not saying that I have to be willing to be martyred and continue in living an obedient life if I'm going to go to heaven? That is what he said. It's what he said. Okay? Friends, is that the true gospel of Scripture? No, it's not. It's not. How does that line up with the fact that the Bible says salvation is a gift? And he's saying, you have to give this up, you have to be willing to give that up, you have to do this, you have to give up this, you have to be willing to be martyred, can't associate with your family anymore if, if need be, to get to heaven? I thought it was a gift. One more verse, Romans 6, verse 23. Now again, why am I covering this? Because I don't want people to have a false hope. And folks, if you're putting confidence in your performance, you have a false hope. Because you are failing. 
you are going to fail. And the confusion of this perseverance of the saints, i.e. discipleship salvation, i.e. lordship salvation, i.e. bilateral salvation, is because it's looking at the performance of the man as a way to qualify you for heaven. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As we have already seen in our study, Jesus paid the full price for our sins. It is not our faithfulness, but his faithfulness that brings salvation. It is not our work, but his work. It is not our sacrifice, but his sacrifice. When you make our works a part of the basis of salvation, you are trusting in the performance of good works for salvation. I hope you see it. And more than that today, more than that, okay, is this. Have you personally understood you are helplessly, hopelessly lost And have you personally put your trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for the payment of your sins? Have you trusted in him as your Savior? Friend, you can't be saved another way. And yet, wow, what God offers us freely by his grace is eternal life. It's a gift. This could be the greatest day of your life. If you've not trusted Christ as Savior, would you trust in him today? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes, please. No one looking around. Friend, I ask you right now, I I just, I, I care about you. God cares about you. God loves us. How do I know? He sent Jesus to die and pay for our sins so we don't have to. He did all the work. He did all the work. It's not us having to do work. He did all the work. And the Bible says if you'll put your trust in Jesus Christ today, he will give you eternal life as a gift. You'll be born again. That is the consistent message of the Bible. You can have eternal life. Would you trust in Christ right where you sit? In the quietness of your mind, God knows your thoughts. cannot make a mistake. You can talk to him. You can pray. There is no formal prayer. Praying doesn't save you. It's faith in Christ that saves you. Lord, the best I know how, I'm trusting in Christ as my Savior today. I put my faith in him. I believe that Jesus has paid for all of my sin when he died and rose again. If you'll trust in him, he'll save you. Now listen, if today, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if today what I've said made sense to you, and today you trusted Christ as Savior... Could I pray for you as we close? I just would like to pray for you. I'm not going to, you don't have to raise your hand. It doesn't get you to heaven. It just lets me know that it made sense to you and today you trusted Christ. I won't embarrass you in any way. I won't have you stand up. But I'd like to pray for you. Is there anyone who would say, you know what, I finally get this. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Yeah, I'd like you to pray for me today. I'd like to do that. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down, say, would you pray for me? Today, I'm, I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Is there anyone? Just slip it up, put it down. Just slip it up, put it down. Can't make a mistake. God knows your thoughts. Please trust Christ if you haven't, friend. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we can never go wrong when our faith is in Christ. Jesus is the Savior. You tell us over and over, and all you ask us to do is to believe in him as our Savior, and he saves us that moment, gives us eternal life. We thank you for that. I do pray, Lord, that you would drive your word home to us. Thank you for all your blessings. We look forward to this afternoon, Lord, and we also look forward to tonight as we come together in our study in 1 John chapter 1, as we continue to understand what it means to walk in fellowship with you. Now please guide us now in Jesus' name, amen.
Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.